Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Tom Ruth Speaker Series. I'm Zach Lehman. I'll be your host tonight. Uh, we had a few technical glitches, uh, but we're ready to go. Hopefully, you're still there with us. Um, the Tom Ruth Speaker Series was created in honor of longtime beloved instructor of history emeritus, Tom Ruth, who taught at the Hill for 33 years and passed away in February 2016. Our guest tonight is Krista Tejan, class of 2008. Krista is a public relations and brand marketing strategist with experience across the music, fashion, lifestyle, and entertainment industries. She began her career in New York City on the agency side, working with major consumer brands like Hennessy, Foot Locker, and Panasonic, as well as entertainment clients such as Naomi Campbell and the ESPY Awards. She also spent time at entertainment company and record label Rock Nation, managing PR strategy and media relations for their vast roster of artists and personalities. Three years ago, Krista joined, joined Reebok's global PR team, leading strategy and communications for the brand's fashion product and streetwear collaborations. At the start of this year, she took on a new role with the brand and now serves as senior manager for Reebok's first ever global creative communications and disruptive marketing team, The Engine. We're gonna learn about The Engine tonight. In this role, she helps lead the ideation and execution of creative ideas that make people think, talk about, and feel something for Reebok. So that's what Krista looks like today. But here's what she looked like when she was at Hill. I promised I wouldn't embarrass her. I think these are pretty good pictures. There she is, prefect, co-head of student activities and Hill Trebles, uh, part of the dream team, whatever that is, we'll find out. Uh, and there she is uh, singing, uh, looks like doing a solo with the Hill Trebles. Uh, let's see if I can uh, get Krista on the line here. We, she actually lost power um, moments yeah. before we were about to uh, start there. Krista, are you there? I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We can see you. Awesome. What do you Great. What do you, think, what do you think of these pictures? I love them. I'm like, I know my, one of my really good friends, Alex, is Alex Backish is on from the Dream Team, and I'll tell you all about it. But I recognize so many of these faces. I'm so happy to see every, <laughs> all of these pictures. It's awesome. So, so what is the Dream Team? The, so the Dream Team was our student activities committee. So Alex and I were co-presidents. We're really, really proud of that. Um, but we, yeah, it's, it was our student activities committee. So we did like six form dance and a bunch of different activities throughout the year for, for the student who, body. Who was the director of student activities? Do you remember? Um, God, Gray, why am Gray, I like, Grace Gray Simpson? Simpson. Yes. Yeah, Simpson. Mr. Simpson. All right. Mr. No, Simpson sure. has gone to the dark side. He's now a teacher at Lawrenceville. Boo. <laughs> That's not what we want to hear. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, so you were on the dream team. You stay on the dream team. Once, uh, yep. once a dream team member, always a dream team member. How about yep. the Hill Trebles? That looks like, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to see if I recognize anyone in that group. Who are those uh, four young so women? So you've got, you've got Ariel, Gabby, um, Charlie, and then Sonia, who are all Hill Trebles with me. Hill Trebles is like, that was, the, that was one of my favorite memories from the Hill. Um, I kind of discovered my love of music through that. So it was awesome. I, and then I did acapella in college too at BC. Do you still sing? I still sing here and there, yeah. Um, I have a piano in my apartment. I like to tool on that when I have some free time. But um, oh, we lost you there. Oh, there you yeah. go. I'm back. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we're, doing, we're doing an iPhone moment now because of this power situation. So we're good. <laughs> well, uh, you know, you mentioned your apartment um, right before the show. You explained to me that. Yeah, you are normally in Boston, but you've made yep. it back down to Florida, to the West Palm Beach area. 
just yeah. to escape from the gloominess of uh, a late winter, early spring in Boston. Uh, yeah, it's it's the weather's always a toss up this time of year there. So it's it's definitely super chilly. It was rainy. It's still rainy. So I'm I'm happy to have a change of, of weather and of pace down here. It's great. Well, I'm gonna um, you know you and I were talking about it. You actually got on a plane. Yeah, I did. Sort of a strange concept right now in our world. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask our attendees who are here, we have, we have over 40 people t uh, tuned in right now. Raise your hand if you've been on a plane in the last week. <laughs> Probably Maybe. zero hands. <laughs> zero hands. Uh, Krista, you are alone. So I'm these, alone. there were four people on the plane and two of them were you and, and your boyfriend, right? So there were two, there were four other people on the plane. So it was like totally empty. There was tons of social distance. Um, it was completely fine. Did you, to, did you get bumped to first class at least? Sadly, no. I was hoping they would, but it didn't happen. Um, I've heard about that happening to some people, but it, it didn't happen for us. But we did. We had like a double mask situation. It was like a whole like hazmat-esque attire happening. Was it, so. was it Reebok branded? Did you have like a... Uh, no, but we're working on that. I can tell you about that a little later. Uh, <laughs> and, and how about the flight crew and people in the airport? Every Pretty desolate? Every, but, yeah, everybody... For the most part, all all personnel in there was was wearing masks and gloves, and it felt very safe. I mean, it was deserted. Like there were maybe twenty people in the airport. It was not like tons of people all around you all the time. <laughs> so you you were on a stay at home order up in Boston pretty early, and and you said yep. that Reebok announced that you're uh, staying at home through June probably. So you yeah, they're, they're about, exactly they're about to announce that through mid June we'll likely be staying home, and then you know I, I work kind of in tandem with our corporate communication team. So sometimes they get info ahead of other people, but they were like, it's probably going to last longer than that too. So. Well, we've just announced you know. it to the entire world here on the webcast. Yeah. Well, there you go. Early, early news for all Reebok employees. Well, I don't think we have any other ones. on the call. <laughs> so, yeah. so Krista, um, when you came to Hill, where were you from? So I'm originally from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. I'm wow. from not far from the Hill. I was a day student for three years and then a, a, a boarder for one. And so uh, where did you go to middle school? So I went to Wincroft okay. down the street. Right. Mm -hmm. Wincrofter, okay. So when you came to Hill, how many of your Wincroft classmates were there in the third form? Hmm. So I know for uh, sure please. there, I know one because I still talk to him this day, Mac Gundy. Um, sure. But I can't remember if there was a ton of other people from my, my class at the time was only 14 kids. Okay. So a lot of kids went to, you know, a lot of the other prep schools in the area on the main line or in New Jersey. So um, I, I I know that there's like room for error here, so I probably like two or three of us went from. But, from but for you, was it a foregone conclusion that you would end up at the Hill? Um, I mean, not always. I mean, I know, so my dad was really, really excited when the, the Hill started letting in girls. So I know like once that happened, I remember him reading in the newspaper and kind of showing the, the front page, or I don't know if it's front page, news right. in the Mercury, but he was like, you're gonna go here now. Um, so that was, I guess it was predetermined from that point, but um, it, it was awesome that they finally kind of opened it up to, to, to women. And I'm really, really grateful that I got the opportunity to go. Well, great. So you were here for four years as a day student and then as, yeah. a, as a boarder. Um, yeah. what, was, what were the highlights of your experience? You mentioned the trebles was part of it, but uh, what were some of the other highlights or mentors that really influenced you and your, your experience here? Oh, mentor wise, I would have to say, so Mr. Rigg, who I don't think is there anymore. He went on to pursue, um, uh, he's, I think, a pastor now in right. Pennsylvania somewhere. Um, but he, he was definitely one of my biggest influences while I was at the Hill. I mean, the amount of literature that he exposed me to while I was there, I, it made me really fall in love with English as a subject. Um, and then who else? Dr. LeBlanc. French was one of my majors in, uh, in college. So I think I kind of credit her a lot for that. She was, you know, she, she believed in me and really kind of instilled this passion for the language in me um, during my time there. Uh, so those are two that definitely stand out. Uh, Mr. Straub, our, our, um, our choral director, he was the best. Like, I, I, it's crazy to think now how young he was at the time. Um, but he just, he had that like youthful energy and it was, it was really a breath of fresh air. It was really fun. Um, I, I run into him from time to time. He's now the choral director, I think at Episcopal High School in Virginia. Oh, nice. Yeah. Different he's the best. And stuff. Yeah. He's terrific. Yeah. And you can't forget the Doherty's. They were, they were my, they were the, you know, the parents of the whole, the whole team. So. 
Well, I just uh, I just chatted with David, uh, uh, Mr. Doherty, by email just a few days ago. He's checked in there, and they're in good health and good spirits. So that was good. good. Um, oh, that's so great. Been yeah. four years at the Hill. You went to Boston College. At I what did. point? At what point did you um, realize you wanted to be in communications and marketing and and uh, and and what what were the things that made you start to think that did anything happen at Hill? Were you doing anything at Hill that? Yeah. Well, I think I mean I I've loved the Dream Team. I I honestly credit with a lot of kind of piquing my interest for events and that whole world and um, just like planning things, logistics. That's like stuff that gets me going. Um, and you know I. I also like we planned our sixth form dance and one of the highlights I was going to mention a minute ago was just getting a gondola on the Dell for our Venice oh, you're the famous form gondola. dance. You're that the was my year. Class. Really proud about it. Yeah. Well yep. So, um, so I think like from an early on, I kind of knew, oh, I, I love events and I love planning these sort of things. And then when I got to college, um, you know, I, I took some internships in communications. Um, and I, I always kind of noticed that people that worked in PR were always around like cool things that were happening. Um, I didn't really understand what they did or, or what, you know, what it involved and the amount of work that it involves, but I always kind of thought, oh, that's, that would be interesting to learn more about. So I took a few internships. Um, I started out interning um, with an agency that I went on to work for after, after college for a bit uh, in healthcare. And then I decided, ah, oh, healthcare, I think it's a little too boring for me. Super interesting, but I'm, I'm more interested in like the consumer uh, packaged goods world and consumer space in general. So um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how it all happened, I guess. And even when I was, you know, at BC, I was our like publicity director for my acapella group, and I I loved I always loved kind of planning logistics, getting our name out there, and and all that. So it kind of felt like a natural fit. So for for some of our students, we have a lot of students on the line tonight. What what are the recommendations? You know, if if they're interested in that kind of career, the career that you followed, what are the kinds of things that you would encourage them to do at Hill and beyond Hill, um, other than join the dream team? Yeah, other than join the dream team. Does the dream team still exist, by the way? Uh, we have it under a new name. Like it, it changed the name changes every few years. But when I first okay. got here, it was called the dream team. And I think it's now called the like Student Life Association. And okay. was, you know, they've, they've had it was called the bomb squad for a while because it was Mr. Bomb. Oh, wow. Uh, Mr. <laughs> bomb. So was, there was some different names along the way. But there it's always yeah. creative. Yeah, I would say, you know, if you're interested in, in the communication space or anything related to PR, you know, just kind of get involved in things, expose yourself to as much as possible. This is a, I mean, I, I know so much about specific um, fields within the public relations, I guess, like field. So, um, you know, I focus specifically on like entertainment, fashion, um, and I've done music in the past. So that's kind of like where I decided those are all things that I'm passionate about and excited about and interested in. Um, so if there's certain worlds that you're interested in and on top of doing communications, I mean, communications is a very wide spectrum of things. You know, you can do anything from corporate communications for, for big corporations and talking more on the business side to healthcare to, you know, fun, exciting entertainment projects and the like. So, Got yeah. It. The, um, people often talk about the Hill Network, uh, you know, Hill Ties <laughs> Network, Sever. Was that ever part of your career path or college path? Were you able to stay connected with Hill people or meet Hill alumni that had helped you along your way? Totally. Um, I, I definitely stayed in touch with alumni um, throughout the years. I guess, um, you know, even in college, just, you know, using people as references um, a few times and, and just using that network to get networked to somebody else who might have gotten my foot in the door somewhere. Uh, for sure, that's been a massive help. I think even, you know, looking to the future in my career, I can see myself still, I connect with New Hill alumni all the time on LinkedIn um, and stay in touch with people. So it's definitely like a lifetime thing. It's awesome. And, and if one of our students or young alums were interested in your field and are listening tonight, they can, uh, they can reach out to you and you, you help them? 100%. I like, I'm, I'm always down to help. I guess when I, when I do this, so I, I get a lot of questions from, especially from BC grads, um, a couple of Hill grads here and there, but they're always like, oh, hey, I went to BC, now hire me, you know, and I'm, I'm always interested to know, you know, not being from a place, it kind of gives you a, uh, it's a great foundation, um, but it's also good to know, like, what's your why? Like, what are you passionate about? Why do you want to work in this field? Or what interests you? What questions do you have for me? You know, because I think it's easy for somebody to say, hey, I got this education but what are you going to do with it? Like, who are you as a person? And what are you, um, 
what skills do you have and how can you kind of like pique my interest in another way to, to get your foot in the door. But I'm always down to help the alumni, always down to help um, that network for sure. So how long have you been at, with the Re, with Team Reebok or with the yeah. Reebok? Company. Just about three years now, coming up on three years in a couple of weeks. And so obviously a huge global brand. Yeah. How do you, how do you land that job? Um, and and yeah. why did you choose to pursue it? Yeah. So I, um, obviously I started on the agency side, kind of like putting in my hours, tons of work, um, working across a lot of different types of clients. Um, the things that I was always come back to that I really loved were, were like the fashion space and this whole world of youth culture and streetwear. Um, so, you know, when I was looking for, for opportunities, um, Reebok actually kind of came to me. Um, I was approached by a recruiter there. Uh, and I, you know, I was super interested in the role because when they reached out to me about it, they didn't say what brand it was, but they said all of these things that kind of piqued my interest. And I was like, wow, I, you know, I kind of get to work in streetwear and I get to use my music background and entertainment background and kind of come up with cool creative ideas. So um, when I found out it was Reebok, it was definitely a bonus. But, um, but yeah, I, I definitely, they, they had a recruiter reach out and I kind of went through the whole process and whatnot um, before I got the job. <laughs> Did you have to like clear out your whole closet and wardrobe and like yes. go over to Reebok? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so when you start, they kind of tell you, so we're owned by Adidas group. So Adidas is like A-OK, -okay, <laughs> but you can't wear any other competitor products. So like no Nike, no New Balance, no Puma. Um, so I did have to clear things out. Um, but yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully they provided some new, new items for you. Yes, as well. definitely. And like working in this field too, I, I deal a lot with, with samples. So I get a lot of products that I, I've actually feel like every season I have to cycle stuff out because I just get so much free stuff yeah. um, and I'm constantly like giving it away to, to friends or like sending it home you know there's just so much stuff um, which you know we could have a whole conversation about that too but um, but yeah. So um, you're, you've been at Reebok for three years when yep. did the sort of the engine uh, concept begin and how did you get involved with that? Yeah, so this was a concept. We had a new marketing head as of like six months ago. Um, and when he came on, he said, I want to start this thing. I have this idea for this team. It was initially called the Disrupt Team, which I felt like was a very old and kind of corny term. But um, he brought in a few people kind of before they devoted actual headcount to the role and said, hey, we're, we're interested in doing this, you know, new team. I don't know what it looks like. There's kind of an open brief, but all I know is that I wanted to create disruptive moments for our brand and help us break through in a, in a very crowded media space and a very crowded industry. Um, so I kind of worked with him along with a few other people to, to build out what that would look like, what the strategy of it would be. And then ultimately I, um, I was asked to join the team full time. So it's kind of unique right now because I've been redeployed, if you will. So I'm in like a dual role. I'm still working on the PR team now just because of everything that's happening and having to maximize like resources right now due to, you know, cut budgets and things going on in the world. But um, I, I also still work on the engine as well. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of how it came about. And, um, you know, the... So would you describe the engine as sort of a skunk works within Reebok, Reebok yeah. like idea generation and... Exactly. Being fresh and... Exactly. It's like an internal creative agency, if you will. We're like the black ops of the company and we get to sit in a room and brainstorm all day and come up with cool creative ideas, throw stuff against the wall, see what sticks. We have a budget and we can kind of just like move on our own with having to go, without having to go through all the different corporate processes of getting everybody's approval and seeing if everybody will be okay with something. If we have a cool idea or we see something happening in pop culture, in the news, and we think Reebok can get involved in it or have something to say or do a really cool event or activation, we can kind of just go and do our own thing. And how do you measure the strength of Reebok's brand? Um, what do you think are the, you know, is it sales? Is it? Uh, yeah. You know, what, what do you, what do you, how do you define it? Yeah. So we, we have this thing called NPS. It's called net promoter score. So essentially we have a bunch of data analysts and people that kind of do all of this market research and speak to consumers. So our consumer is, um, you know, an 18 to 25 year old kid. Um, and they're kind of on the cusp. They're like more toward the back end of Gen Z. So they're, they're really kind of growing up in this whole digital environment. Um, so a lot of how we measure awareness for the Reebok brand is around how much does that kid know about what we're doing um how much do they think about us first when they're when they're making shopping choices 
Um, and certainly sales are part of it too, 100%. Um, but that's like a big one we use and there's a variety of different factors that go into that. And how do you define or, or how does Reebok define their brand? What's their brand and brand promise? Yeah, so it's been many things over the years. Um, this is part of why we created this team. Um, I think we're a brand that obviously has such a unique heritage. You know, when people think about Reebok, they have this nostalgic feeling and start thinking about what we meant back in the 80s and 90s um, in terms of fitness culture with Jane Fonda and the, the freestyle high, you know, that, that classic uh, fitness shoe with all the women in leotards doing really awesome fitness moves that I could never do. Um, and then in the 90s with basketball culture, you know, with Allen Iverson, Shaq, um, some really iconic uh, sports figures. So I think that's, that's like what our heartbeat is, is that, um, that heritage that we have, you know, we, at one point we were bigger than Nike. And I think now the challenge for us is, okay, we, we have that heritage, but it's how do we make it relevant today? Um, so we're definitely still aiming to be the best fitness brand in the world. Um, that's, that's kind of like our North star is just create the best fitness product in the world. But simultaneously, we don't want to forget this kind of fun, um, bold, uh, like daring and irreverent personality that we did have in the eighties and nineties with our advertising and, and even into the early two thousands. So there's a lot of things that we are trying to bring back today. And I think we've had a lot of successes, a lot of failures and are learning a lot still. And I think we have a definite advantage being um kind of a challenger brand if you will we can take more risks and do do cooler things what is the number one selling reebok product so of, of all time maybe of all time it would definitely have to say it's the classic leather um or the freestyle high so the classic leather i'm, I'm sure it's it's literally a classic white shoe that we have with a gum bottom um freestyle high is again that old fitness silhouette that we had um but I'm sure you're familiar. We, we did sign a partnership with CrossFit about 10 years ago. Um, so we developed products specifically for, for CrossFitters um, and like extreme fitness that, you know, that whole world. So we make this shoe called the Nano, which is literally best in class, top performing um, tech shoe or training shoe rather. So, uh, so yeah, those, those three are like kind of always competing to be the best. Okay. And, um, and in your bio, and you mentioned it before, you're sort of in streetwear, which yep. is uh, presumably not fitness. So define yep. that category for us. Yeah. So streetwear is kind of an element of, I mean, it's a fashion space entirely and it's kind of made its way into high fashion. Um, but it's, it kind of originates from, you know, urban environments and, and hip hop, hip hop culture, honestly. So, um, you know, a lot of what I work on is our fashion collaborations and streetwear collaborations. So I partner with, you know, sneaker, uh, sneaker shops, more boutique sneaker shops in New York and Japan and um, in LA. And we do a lot of collaborations with these guys. So trying to, you know, just get their name in the press when we do these sort of collaborations. Um, and then we also have more high fashion collabs that I work on too. Um, so anywhere from Victoria Beckham, Pierre Moss, which I'm not sure you're familiar with. That's kind of like a newer upcoming fashion brand. Um, and, and yeah, what one that I can't announce, but like a massive, massive fashion house that we're announcing soon. <laughs> uh, yeah. So definitely not uh, academic casual at Hill or. No, definitely academic. not academic. You're, you're totally different. <laughs> I would say if I showed anybody at Reebok that photo of me in a blazer and a, and like a J Crew shirt, they would be like, who are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm, sending them, I'm sending them that. Yeah. That's, that's going out next. Now that you've announced that Reebok has. Uh, gone until June. We're sending this uh, to them tomorrow. Yeah, great. Okay, awesome. <laughs> uh, okay, so amazing career, like awesome brand. Things are yeah. flying high. And then January, early February hits, COVID-19, shut down yep. in Boston, corporate offices shut down, probably international manufacturing in many ways shut down. Big time. Um, so, so what's you know, post COVID-19 life like at, at Reebok, one of the biggest brands in the world. Yeah. So as you mentioned, um, you know, factories shut down. So our factories are based in Asia. So they're based in China and in Vietnam. So obviously that's where all of this originated. <laughs> um, so we were kind of already dealing with product delays even before, you know, this came to, to the U.S. in the way that it has. Um, you know, obviously from an operations standpoint, everything's gone online, everything's digital, we're, we're Zooming, we're on Teams, we're, you know, 
chatting and texting and FaceTiming each other. Um, so in a lot of ways, um, I'm actually, I've actually been joining a lot of recent brainstorms about this, but the business has actually moved faster. It feels like there's a lot less um, meeting in person and wasting time talking about things. We can easily get things done virtually. Um, but yeah, I mean, even from, so just from my personal expertise, a lot of what I do deals with, you know, relationships and people and, um, and media journalists. So these people are obviously inundated with news right now and having to cover a million different things and getting thousands of emails a day. So when you're no longer able to say, hey, let's meet for a drink and let me pitch you this new product we're coming out with, you have to find new creative ways to, to talk to people. Um, plus, certainly plus, plus, there's no new products coming out. There's, right. there's definitely still new products coming out. Well, I mean, out. Not, I mean you're not manufacturing. You're, you're, you're Correct. selling yeah. things online, but your yeah. shippers well, are things, your, yeah. Exactly. And product, I mean, we're on like an 18 month product cycle. So things are still kind of coming out we'll, where we'll see the delay and the issues are like down the line um, or they'll just have to make it back up on the back end. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I think, um, that's, that's definitely been a, a tough one is just figuring out how to navigate, you know, relationships with press and even, even going into budget cuts. Um, everybody's kind of like, wait a minute, we don't, we can't open our retail, retail stores right now. So we have to drive all of our business to Reebok.com. Um, and we have to cut our budgets. So we've had done a lot of marketing budget cuts. Um, so you kind of feel it in that again, like I've been redeployed back onto the PR team part-time to, to help because they no longer can use their PR agency. So there's very real implications in all of this. Um, and you, but, but by the same token, it kind of forces you to innovate and, and stretch yourself and figure out where you can maximize resources and honestly take a look at, okay, maybe we could have been doing this differently all along, you know? Yeah, I think we're all learning some of those lessons that we may apply down the road. I'm, I'm interested in hearing from you what some of those are in a moment, but um, uh, Reebok also has, you know, a, a pretty large social mission. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, around human rights, uh, yeah. other global issues. So ha has, has that become uh, a bigger focus right now as you start to lean into that? 100%. I don't think any brand can really do anything right now that just feels like, hey, buy this product just because, you know, people are, this is really affecting people. I mean, people are dying. So, you know, you have to, you, you can only lead with a message that feels human focused and socially focused. Um, so every, every plan, everything we're doing right now, I mean, I'm, I'm on a COVID-19 task force that is solely dedicated to looking at what can we be doing to speak to our consumers in a way that, um, you know, we're giving back uh, to the local community, to essential workers, um, to the World Health Organization and other similar organizations. So that's a big, big piece of it. Um, I mean, it's honestly the biggest piece right now. Well, you mentioned earlier, uh, I asked you about um, the masks and, and you said you're, you had something you wanted to share, like you guys are working on something, some sort yeah. of PD approach or something like that. Yeah, so I mean, we're gonna be, we've been creating masks kind of on a local level. So, you know, the tough thing is, you know, I'm sure everybody saw New Balance put out and Nike, a lot of, a lot of brands that are, you know, US based are, you know, turning over their factories to create PPE and masks for, for local healthcare workers um, and essential workers. We're in a unique position where we can't really do that because our factories are in Asia. Um, so what we can do is we, we have this thing called the Maker's Lab on site at our, at our headquarters where we've kind of like turned that over and done some small quantity mass creation just locally for the Boston area. Um, but we also will be rolling out, um, you know, more uh, kind of like fitted, more plantful masks that are being created at our, at our factories um, in tandem with Adidas. So that's something that we're doing. Um, in addition to in addition to everything else, but I think there's there's something really interesting there, and it's it's, it's something we're discussing a lot because there was an article in in High Snobiety, which is like the streetwear culture magazine, about I, how I, I read it all the time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, but it's uh it's it was about how you know masks might become the new sneaker culture, um, and you know I I'm sure I'm not sure how familiar familiar you are with sneaker culture but I mean it's this whole hype culture about you know limited limited edition drops happening and lines out the door at Supreme and all these different brands so um 
it's, it's really interesting to think about how masks might be the next hot commodity and what collaborations will be happening on the mask front. Um, so that's something we're starting to think about uh, on our side too. And, and additionally, like what other personal protective equipment or apparel can we create knowing that we are a company that specializes in that stuff? How can we leverage our existing infrastructure to support, um, support you know, essential workers and eventually just regular human beings as they go about their day because the world's going to be forever changed. Sure. Um, well, I'm going to, uh, I have one other question, but I want to remind our audience that you can ask questions. So there's two ways to do that. Um, I'll ask my last question and then we'll start turning to our audience. Um, sure. You either click on the Q&A button on the bottom and type in your question. We already have uh, one or two of those. Um, so please start typing in some questions. So we'll have a, a pool of questions to go to. And then you can also raise your hand and when you raise your hand, I can either allow you to speak and if you are comfortable, uh, we can also turn on your video. Um, hopefully there's some of Krista's classmates out there or contemporaries from Hill and they, they haven't sent- I hope so. They haven't sent in any embarrassing uh, pictures yet. Um, so one of, the, one of my questions is, I know that Reebok is also involved with a lot of um, pro, pro sports and college sports. Um, you know, there's a lot of question right now about resuming athletics, uh, uh, professional athletics, you know, NBA, uh, you know, Major League Baseball, you know, the NFL draft is going on, you know, um, is, is Reebok thinking of, of ways that they can support the return to, you know, the professional or college athletic um, schedule in a way that would be healthy? I mean, I would, you're talking about masks, uh, you know, I don't yeah. think anyone's come up with a mask yet that's, you know, sort of breathable enough for a, you know, a football player or a basketball player to wear. Um, yeah. I'm curious so it's, about it's, that. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's tough. So we're, we're no longer in professional sports in the way we used to be, or even college sports for that matter. Um, but in a community that we're really, really invested in is the training community and the fitness community. So when you think about small businesses and gyms, um, you know, trainers that their entire business was based on being in person with somebody and helping correct and, you know, build workouts for them. They've had to transition to a totally virtual business and it's a very, very crowded space when you start removing actually physically being able to go somewhere. So we're doing a lot of, uh, we're doing a lot of work in, in that world um, and trying to highlight our trainer community, support them via small grants um, and things like that. But certainly we, we have a huge team right now thinking about uh, kind of future future state in the next few months um, and a more phased approach about, okay, if they start loosening these social distancing restrictions, you know, what will that, what will that look like for sport? What will that look like for fitness and these small businesses um, and, and even our own gyms uh, around the globe? So uh, it's definitely something we're thinking about. There's no concrete plan necessarily to share yet, but there's a lot of ideas, a lot of really awesome ideas. And I, I know that Adidas, um, being big brother to my company, um, they they play a lot in the sports space, especially with their you know the the soccer um, that they support and, and all that stuff. So they're definitely thinking about that. I, I know that they have some some pretty big exciting uh, campaigns and initiatives coming up. Um, well, I hope that if you do get into the mask business in like a uh, a branded kind of way, you, you know maybe you can design a very cool hill branded totally mask, limited edition. You know, uh, yeah, one hundred percent. I think we might have to commission some um, some Hill students to do some cool one-off yeah. collabs or something. We'll we'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. you ready to hear from our audience? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so uh, one of our alumni, uh, Emily, who you might know, uh, says, "What percentage of your disruptions and activations are live versus digital?" Assuming some yeah. are live, how are you pivoting without being able to do live activations? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, it's, it's interesting because we were like two months in and then all of this happened. Um, and a lot of the things that we were initially activating were live events. Um, and, but we, we do do a lot of digital. So I guess like the first part of the question, just in terms of the split, I'll talk about like the past state and in an ideal state where there's no social distancing and COVID's not happening, it would probably be about like a 20% live and then 80% digital. So we obviously want to be digital first. That's where our consumer is. Um, you know, we want to find ways to speak to them via social media, um, via our own 
website and, you know, maybe other, some other digital platforms. But I think, um, you know, obviously in the current state, we can't do any live events. We have a whole events team that's had to be redeployed amidst all of this. So I think, you know, it's definitely, it's, it's all about digital right now. It's a hundred percent digital and finding ways to, um, to, again, as I said before, speak to our consumer, but be authentic and understanding and not just like hawking product all day and saying, buy this, buy this, buy this. Um, because people are kind of scared to buy right now. I mean, if you look at the economy right now, people are afraid to spend. So you have to find ways to really speak to people. And I think the way to do that right now is through, you know, showing how we are giving back and genuinely caring about those that this is affecting the most. Um, but yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how this evolves over time, especially with my small team. Yeah. Well, um, the next question comes from one of your former faculty members, Mr. Dolhoff. Oh, hi, Mr. Dolhoff. I was his prefect at Delborn. <laughs> well, he said, he says, Krista was our prefect, and it's great <laughs> to hear about her career arc. If you want to make her fear, feel old, you could tell her that William and Patrick are both Hill students now. Oh, my God. Yeah. No Not way. One will be a sixth former next year. Uh, so that, you know, you're definitely old now, Krista. Oh my uh, God, I'm definitely old. That definitely, I mean, I'm, that's amazing. I need to see pictures of them because I just remember them as like small children that I would like babysit here and there. Um, but that's amazing. Oh, I, oh, I'm so happy I don't have any pictures handy of them, but maybe Mr. Dolhoff will. Yeah, he'll have to send them to me. He'll or... text them to me and I'll pop them on or something. Uh, he'll send yeah, them, I'll it. let him send them to you. We're not going to embarrass <laughs> William and Patrick. Uh, in any event, he does have a question here. Uh, his question is, I'm wondering how Krista went about educating herself about Reebok of the 80s and 90s as she started her work there. I'm also wondering if she's heard any conversations at Reebok about bringing back some of its manufacturing to the U.S. Yeah, so both good questions. So the first piece of the question was about how I educated myself um, on our past, because um, I didn't live through it. Honestly, I like was growing up in a time where we were kind of on the downside of being like at the peak of popularity. So, um, you know, for me, I think the only time I had ever really heard about Reebok and any of their, you know, talent partners, if you will, was because I was a 76ers fan growing up. And I knew that Alan Iverson <laughs> was like a Reebok ambassador, um, as controversial as he was at the time, but also super iconic. So, um, for me, that's kind of where my knowledge like started and ended, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I did a lot of my own research and just kind of looking back and you really start to realize, wow, the history of this brand is so unique and unlike anything else. You know, I think when you look at a lot of the brands of today, the Nikes, Adidas, Pumas, um, and some of their collaborations that they do with, with musical artists. I mean, Reebok was really the first brand to do that. Um, you know, we signed Jay-Z back in the day when nobody was even touching a hip-hop artist. Like, people were not signing people that looked like Allen Iverson. Um, and now, if you look at, you know, on any given day, a brand is signing a new rapper or singer or, you know, uh, or artist of some kind. And that's... The way, kind of... They have not signed a headmaster yet. Okay, so you could be the first. The streetwear look next year, you know, if we... <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we might have to do like a hype headmaster like makeover day I or think something. I, I could use I it. We can make that. I, I was, I was, uh, as I was getting ready for this event, I, I asked my wife. I said, "What does one wear uh, <laughs> for this particular interview?" Uh, I don't have. I, I just don't have cool clothes. So. Uh, oh, well, then, we can definitely change that. Um, second, but, uh, Mr. Dolhoff's second question was around. Yeah. Um, uh, moving uh, manufacturing back to the U.S. is that it? Uh, was that it already yeah. a conversation, or are you thinking about that more now as a result of this, or where is it's that? It's definitely from? yeah, it's definitely been a conversation. So we do we do manufacture small quantities of things in the U.S. and we actually are we have a whole division called our futures department um, that's focused on like future technology and kind of eliminating waste in in the fashion space and just making everything super sustainable. So we have this technology. Um, that's kind of all liquid focused and creating soles of shoes out of liquid and plastic byproducts, essentially. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's essentially zero waste. So that factory is based in, in Rhode Island. We have a lot of different things like that that are more um, local in the US. But in terms of a large scale factory that can pump out hundreds of thousands of products, we don't have that yet. Um, and honestly, most of our business is, our, our three big key markets are, um, are China, 
Europe and the US, and the US is the smallest of those three. So to service Asia, it's, it really is the right place for us to be right now. It's just unfortunate <laughs> in the current times that um, you know, well, we're actually, not, we uh, don't have anything nearby. We've had, we've had other, we had one of our alums from uh, Hong Kong who, you know, they're actually several months ahead of us in terms of getting yeah. back to work. So you might actually yeah. uh, get back online there sooner than you think. All right, yeah, we, have, no, uh, we have a question. Someone's raised their hand, are you ready? Oh, great. I'm ready. Okay. So this is Emily. Uh, she's one of our current students. Emily, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Do you want to go video, Emily, or are you good with the voice? I'm good with just the voice. Thank you. Okay. Emily, how are <laughs> you, by the way? I'm good. How are you? Good. How's your family doing? They're good. It's, uh, it's nice having everyone in one house. All, all three hills, uh, one alum and two students are home? Yes. Oh boy, I think that's a, uh, a handful. All right, you have a question for Krista. Um, it goes off of Mr. Dahlhoff's question a little bit, but with your factories being in Asia, how are you dealing with the prejudice that has developed around the virus starting there? How are you advertising to your customers that your merchandise is safe for purchase? That's a really, really great question. Um, so I know that Obviously, our, our whole Asia team had to deal with this ahead of all of us in the U.S. So when I say us, I mean our global team. So it's, it's interesting because we're HQ'd in Boston, um, but a lot of our business is done overseas. So a lot of the time that market is having to kind of work independently to, to you know, problem solve and come up with their own plans related to what's happening locally there. Um, so in terms of prejudice, um, I know that They've had to be extremely careful with any communications that are put out right now. We haven't, I haven't personally heard of anything related to that um, for our Asian market, but um, I think that that's, it's, that's a really great question. Um, and then in terms of letting people know that our products are safe, I think that that's a really great point and something we're definitely going to need to discuss. I think the whole world is thinking about that right now. I mean, even you know, we, we can't even produce masks uh, in general, I'm not talking about Reebok in, in our own country. We have to outsource it right now. So how do we even know that that stuff is safe? Um, and I, you know, there's obviously a lot of prejudice uh, involved in that too. So I think it's, it's definitely something to think about and it's a really great point. And I'm gonna bring that up because um, I wanna make sure that we're, we're thinking about, you know, from all sides, how we can, you know, ensure our customers that things are safe to buy and, and, and good products made humanely, um, made sustainably. So that's, that's all part of it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for yep. the question, Emily. Good to hear your voice. Thank you, have a good evening. You too. Uh, we have another live question. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, Sean, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, you're a little, uh, you're a little soft, but speak into your microphone a little bit better. All right. What about now? Much better. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have uh, two two questions. Uh, the first one is, what is your opinion and um, kind of like what have you learned about um, like sustain uh, sustainability and specific to like high fashion? Um, and mm -hmm. you like uh, any kind of like new technologies that have coming out? Because I know that it's it's kind of a new trend now. Uh, I know a lot of brands are kind of hopping on the wave. Um, but yeah. I kind of your overall opinion on that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So, so I think if you look at high high fashion, so I'm talking about like brands that would show at Fashion Week, brands that are like in vogue in every major publication that you would have heard about by now. Um, they're all. This is this is the conversation to be had. I think the number one thing in the fashion industry is waste. So when you think about, you know, production of things, you're not producing things because you know how much you need to be produced or you need to produce. You're producing things because um, you're hoping that you're going to fulfill orders um, and you're not necessarily creating things based off like a one-to-one -one purchase. So um, sustainability is like a huge, huge topic um, in my industry and also within like the high fashion space. Um, as it relates to Reebok, I mean, we're doing a lot uh, in terms of sustainability. We're not, I definitely can't claim that we are 100% sustainable, but we do have a plan over the next five years to start phasing out some of those not sustainable practices and start phasing in more sustainable practices. So we, a lot of that has to do with, with plastics and foam. Um, we currently have a, a shoe that we're going to be releasing this fall that's completely plant-based. 
Um, we have a shoe that's completely biodegradable and made from corn. Um, so it's kind of looking at how can you produce these materials that are, you know, biodegradable, 100% sustainable, um, can be, you know, cycled back into the earth. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like high fashion, you know, no brand, I don't think any brand will, will have longevity if they're not considering sustainability, um, in, in the future at all. I mean, also I, I believe it's Stockholm. I forget which fashion week, but now they have sustainability requirements for you to be able to even show at that fashion week. Um, so I'm, I'm certain that, you know, New York fashion week isn't as, isn't what it used to be, but I'm sure guidelines similar to that will be in place in the future. Um, in terms of brands having to meet certain standards as it relates to sustainability before they even are able to show and have that platform. Sean, thanks for the question. Hope you're doing well. Wait, can I, can I ask one more? Of course, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I heard that you mentioned that you uh, kind of collaborated with Pierre Moss. So uh, yeah. I wanted to know like kind of what it was like working with Kirby Jean Raymond and, and kind of like that kind of, I guess, atmosphere or, you know, if, if you got to meet him personally and just kind of yeah. like, something like that. Totally. I work with Kirby all the time. He's great. Um, you know, he, he's super talented. And I think when we first signed him, um, he wasn't very well known at all. So I think in many ways, we, we helped kind of launch both his personal brand while simultaneously launching this collaboration with him. So we definitely gave him a really amazing platform to grow from. Um, he's definitely somebody who challenges the norm. So he, you know, he obviously, most of his apparel, if not all of his apparel, has a social stand. So he's, you know, very much about making sure that those are, that are underprivileged, um, you know, people of color have a voice um, and he does that through his clothing. Um, that's, that's like the biggest piece of it. So he's, he's awesome to work with. Um, he knows what he wants. So I think people on the design team might feel differently because he, he's very, very particular, but um, he's definitely uh, somebody that we'll be seeing for, for quite a while um, in the years to come. He's definitely still on the up and up. So we're happy to have him as a partner. Sean, Sean, you just put me to shame. You know all these names. I'm really <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so Sean's fun. clearly our target consumer, so I'm yes, glad yeah. that he knows. Sean, you're <laughs> going to have to help me with my styles next year, okay? I will do. I, I, we, can, we can work on that. Okay. All right, Sean, have a good night. Thank you. You guys, you too. Thank you. All right, so we have a question from the president of our alumni association, Rob Wally, who's been a regular listener. Um, he okay. said, I'm interested in hearing about your rock nation experience uh, yeah we've seen many musical artists sharing their talents online during COVID-19 from a PR perspective what role do you think musical artists can play in promoting public health care messages to the public Ooh, that's an interesting and multifaceted question so I guess my experience at rock nation was an interesting one I was working with a lot of you know they have a huge huge roster of talent um so I think you know, if I were putting myself in the shoes today of still being in that role um, and having to advise clients on, on what they should be doing, it's, you know, music is, is solace for a lot of people. It provides calm in the storm. It's, it's something that, you know, when people, you know, are, are, are struggling, they, they look to that for, for, um, for clarity and for an escape. So I think, um, you know, artists are more important than ever. I think artists of all kinds are more important than ever. Artists, artistry is about, you know, commenting on on cultural on culture and what's happening in the current day so the best art comes out of times like this i would say um so in terms of was the last part of the question about helping like the healthcare community and yeah, how can artists um, use their talent to promote public health yeah to promote public health i mean you know i think they they should you know i i think that they should promote public health they should promote you know social distancing or whatever the the new directive of the day is um i think that that's we had that we had that i think that having the other night yeah i think that having a platform like that bears a lot of responsibility and if you're not um it, it wouldn't be well advised to be going against what people are saying to do if you're if you're that big and if you have that big of a platform like you should be um working for the the greater good and, and telling people kind of what is in their best interest i would guess great okay we've got another hand up mm -hmm. uh, this is greta she's one of our students hi greta hi do you want to appear on video uh sure if you want 
Okay, we're going to promote you to panelist. Hold on. And then, <laughs> uh, this is always fun, Greta. We get to see what your house looks like. Hold on. Uh, sorry. Oh, there she is. Hi, Greta. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Greta. Krista, Krista, this is Greta. She's not too far away from campus. She's a fifth former. Oh, I am nice. And I'm in Troubles also. You're in Trouble? Oh, awesome. Troubles. <laughs> oh, Troubles. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you were in Trouble. She is no. a Treble. <laughs> and she's uh, quite a Treble. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so I, I wanted to know how much your career has informed your own personal style and vice versa. Oh, my God. Every, my entire career. Is, so I... I really do. I, I don't think that I, I think as you grow into yourself and you, as you grow into your career and just your person, you figure out how your style can really communicate who you are. Um, I think, you know, being at Hill and even at Wincroft before that, you know, you're wearing a uniform every day. So you're not really thinking about, okay, what does my outfit say about me and what I think? And I would always be jealous of, you know, public school kids because they, you know, they got to express themselves and you'd see emo kids and you'd see preppy kids and you'd see all, all sorts of different groups form just based on expressing themselves through personal style. Um, and so I think like throughout my career, my style's definitely changed a ton. I mean, if you looked at a picture of me from like even two, three, four years ago, I'd be wearing something completely different than what I'm wearing today. You know, I'm, and even recently, just with everything going on, I've been doing a lot of like closet clean out and getting rid of things, cycling things out. And I'm really thinking a lot about just like minimalism and like simplicity. And I'm like obsessed with Steve Jobs and the fact that he just wore a black turtleneck and jeans every day. And it like kept life simple. So I'm, you know, right now I'm like, okay, let me just buy some, some pieces that I think would be investment pieces, but just keep life simple, um, which I think, you know, maybe says a lot about me too. I, I like to mix high high fashion with low fashion and you know obviously Reebok but um there is something to be said for not having to think so much about your style and just keeping it simple um and sometimes that says the most in the end you know what I mean I, I think like you know a, a lot of people nowadays are like oh just because I wear this brand I suddenly know so much about fashion that doesn't tell me you mean anything that tells me you have money um so I think you know it's like styles is everything about you. And it's, um, it's something I'm super passionate about. And my style will probably change like every, I mean, I, my hair right now looks like it's longer, but I like had almost shaved it down to a buzz cut last year. Like I changed my hair all the time. I had like purple hair in January. So um, I like to change up my style all the you time. Go with my look. You can go with my look. Yeah, I, I did almost have your look. I was rocking that look. Almost. It's, I rock this look <laughs> all the time. And that's what you say about me. Uh, Fred, you, you had a written question as well. Do you want you want to ask that question? Oh, oh, sure. Um, so I wanted to ask about um, what your thoughts were for spring fashion trends, and if there were really any ones that were still emerging amidst you know COVID. Spring fashion trends include sweatpants, sweatshirts, <laughs> slippers, socks. That is like literally. I, I'm being 100% serious. Like we had all these things planned. You know, I'm sure press, like from a from a media standpoint, had all these stories planned around spring trends. All that's out the window. Everything right now is about loungewear. I mean, we're talking about like Mother's Day and, and pitching to to journalist stories about like what do you even gift your mom now? And you know, it's it's all loungewear. Like everything you're going to be, everything people are buying right now is that. Um, I mean, not everything, but that's what we're focused on right now. And definitely, in terms of trends, I would say you know. I like to keep it simple with like a black sweat pant and a black sweatshirt, but you know, there's, you know, you can get creative with it. So actually uh, my entire wardrobe has become very fashionable. I have all Yeah, the pretty much. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm actually, yes, I'm sure it has. <laughs> well, Greta, sweat thanks for your in. good questions. Thanks and so much. Being a loyal uh, listener, uh, give <laughs> my best to your family, okay? Okay, I will. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, she's gone. Uh, uh, so we have another uh, question here. What does the next decade hold for marketing via social media? What will another platform eclipse it? Yeah, um, so social media, if you think about it 10 years ago, um, just thinking about 10 years into the future. So 10 years ago, we really only had like Facebook and Instagram was barely out. Um, and that was kind of when I was graduating college. So, you know, it's impossible to say what the future of social media looks like. Um, there's new platforms coming out every day. And the platform of the moment is obviously TikTok. 
um, that's, that's one that I think like our brand is, we're still trying to figure out, okay, what's the voice of TikTok? Because each individual social platform has its own unique voice, I guess, and, and its own unique purpose. So the purpose of TikTok and the thing that I'm like learning is that I really do try to understand young people. And I'm like really, really excited to be hearing from a lot of you guys tonight because you're like piquing my interest in a lot of ways. But I think, um, you know, it's like what makes them tick. And it really is about just like creativity, humor, not taking things so seriously because everything is so serious outside of the four walls of your home right now. So I think um, it'll be interesting to see what new platforms arise. I think social media is definitely here to stay for better or for worse. Um, but I think that there'll be, you know, there'll be new platforms coming out every day. People will decide that there's a new, new trends are emerging on social all the time. Um, you know, what, what, what thrives on TikTok right now is weird, weird stuff. Like yeah. weird content that doesn't make any sense to, you know, my parents, but makes total sense to my younger brother, you know? So, I, think, um, I mean, I know it's, it's sort of strange, but this notion of webcasts and Zoom, I mean, none of us were really using this in a, in a significant yeah. way and, and now it's all we're using, right? Uh, it's, it's all we're using. And then you think about, you know, how, what will happen to these platforms when we have to go back in person and hang out in person. And I was actually thinking about a really funny idea the other day. If, for, we were talking about I'm looking forward to that problem, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. No agreed. But you know, just will we, will we be, will we be able to talk in person anymore? You know, like, I know that's a really, obviously we will, but I just, um, it's interesting to think how all this stuff is impacting us. We're um, going to need our virtual background wherever we go. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's all part of the fashion. All right. I have another uh, hand up. You're, you're getting a lot of hands up tonight. I got to tell you. Great. I'm excited. Uh, Tramon Tran, who's one of our students from Vietnam. I don't know if she's awesome. Tramon, are you there. Yeah. Hi. Are you tuning hi. in to Vietnam or are you here in the States? I'm still in the States. Hopefully I'll be able to fly home. Are you in Chicago? Is that what I heard? Yes, I am in Chicago. Okay, great. Well, it's good to hear your voice and you're there with your dad. Yes, I am here with my dad. Awesome. Well, Tramon, uh, you've got Krista's attention. Uh, what would you like to ask? So, Krista, uh, it's a, actually really funny, but my mom is one of the franchisees of Reebok. So, amazing. Um, yeah, so I was going to ask, how do you, as a such a big brand, like, stay in the trend of, like, the Asia market, knowing that, like, Reebok has, like, thousands of stores worldwide? Yeah, so we have, so I guess I'll go into a little bit of like our product life cycle without like boring everybody on the call, but we do have product managers who go out into these markets. So they take what's known as inspiration trips, which I like wish I could take inspiration trips, but they go out into the markets. Um, they go out to Japan, to Korea, um, to Vietnam, which is where most of our factories are based, um, as well as China. Um, and they're kind of seeing what's happening on the streets there trend wise. So it's not like we create one range of products just for everywhere globally. Mm -hmm. We're creating specialized ranges of products based on what's, what's trending in that market. Um, one of our most famous shoes, the Insta Pump Fury, um, which you're probably familiar with knowing <laughs> your daughter of a, a Reebok gal. Um, but it's, it is the number one most popular shoe in Asia, um, has been for years, and it's the weirdest looking shoe. It's so weird and um, and controversial, like I guess polarizing in the US that it like barely even sells here. Like we can barely even sell like 500 pairs of it here. Um, but in Asia, this is like the number one shoe. So trend wise, Asia's definitely ahead of the US. I would say it's like light years ahead in certain markets. Um, the style there is absolutely incredible. Um, but we're definitely creating product ranges based on what is trending in those individual markets. It's not just like one thing, like across the board for, for everybody. Right. Oh, and just an idea about the whole TikTok thing. So like, usually TikTok has a lot of challenges. So I remember my mom running this marathon for Reebok, right? And yeah, our challenge. So I thought, you know, like maybe something related to uh, shoes and TikTok. So like some sort of challenges with shoes and dancing is I a love that. Of uh, of, of I love that. You should follow our TikTok channel because it's like blowing up. And we have this really <laughs> awesome young kid who we basically gave him full reign to create content for it. And the stuff on there is so weird, but I think it's absolutely like authentic to what people want to see on TikTok. So go like check it out. It's it's great. But that's that's an awesome point. I mean, we're trying to we're coming up with new challenges every day. So I'm just hoping like one of them really hits and goes more viral. 
but we'll see. <laughs> right. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, totally uh, trying to figure out uh, what this looks like. So this is the Insta Pump. Yes, that's the Insta Pump Fury. That's like that's not the OG as we call it, like the original one. That's, that's, um, that's like the mid. So it's got that sock liner in the middle, but that is like Hill school colors. So I, I see why you pulled that up. I, it's really nice. Yeah. I've been, I might have to go into your seeing this all day. So yeah, those are, pretty, those are pretty, those are pretty cool. Uh, we could add those to the dress code next year. You should, I don't <laughs> see why not. <laughs> It'd be like popular, like Sperry's. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Tremond, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Good luck uh, making your way home and, and uh, give my best to your family. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Krista. Thanks. All right. So we have a couple more questions here. Um, sure. they're, they're coming in fast and furious. Uh, actually, a little bit of a follow-up to the question that Tremond just asked. Um, earlier today, NPR aired a piece uh, claiming that some retail locations for some brands will never reopen. The Gap was cited as one example. How do you see the current model of retail storefronts changing both from COVID as well as changing consumer behaviors and preferences? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's really sad what's happening to the gap. I mean, I don't, I hope they make it just because they're such an, a brand that's been around for forever, but you know, it, it is a sign of the times, I guess. Um, for us, you know, our retail stores are closed indefinitely right now until local and regional guidelines say that we can reopen. Um, so, you know, it, it is, it's it's going to be tough and we're going to have to kind of take it week by week day by day to see you know what what to do i it's hard to say what consumer behavior will be because i think even though they lift restrictions that doesn't necessarily mean people are going to come flooding back to stores you know i think people are it's like once one new normal arises once you go everybody keeps saying we're going to get back to the way it was i don't think that that exists i don't think that's going to exist anymore um in the way that we're used to so it's something we're going to have to just evaluate and 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 see i don't know that all retail locations are going to be able to stay open i think um to the to the npr article that i haven't read but would love to i think that that um that's spot on i think people are going to have to assess okay where where are people you know in places like New York City, are people gonna even wanna go out of their homes? They might be social distancing for the next two years, you know, but in places like Florida where I am, maybe maybe people are willing to go to malls and go shop in person just to get out of the house. So you, I just you, it'll you definitely depend it, where you are. Sorry, you mentioned yourself that you've sort of been cleaning out your closets and going a little bit more minimalist. Yeah. Um, I think we're all realizing that, you know, some of our, I mean, first of all, we all have less money, right? So we're buying less yeah. things, theoretically. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're also maybe realizing we didn't need all those things to begin with. So that, that will change some of those consumer patterns for sure. But, you know, we have a, we have a fairly short memory for these things. Um, I was reading yeah. about people generally will not remember what it was like to live through a pandemic, you know, two or three years ago. It'll be a blur. Um, and we'll go back to our old practices eventually. So, but I, I yeah. think there's definitely going to be a thinning out of all sorts of industries, not just the retail industry, right? 100%. I think that people are going to think more about, and I know like even this was something I, I, I did want to bring up is, you know, now that people don't have access to be in person with people, or maybe you had a business that was solely focused on brick and mortar, you're going to start thinking about, okay, how can I be more digital? Because this will happen again. Something like this could happen. Something worse could happen. You know, it's just thinking about well, how can I, you know, develop a skill set where I can thrive in any environment? How can I make my business indispensable regardless of the environment? Um, but I think like, you know, it's 2020. I mean, the amount of online shopping is, is making retailers go out of, out of business left and right. Um, so, you know, anything's possible. Right. H has Reebok seen a growth in their online business in the last two months? 100%. Yeah. So, um, I'm just buying sweatpants and loungewear. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, people, you know, in indoor fitness indoors is, is a, is obviously a big, big thing right now. Cause there's very few things that you can do in your house. So, you know, people are definitely buying, um, fitness apparel. I, I can't say for sure if our sales are up or down overall or anything like that, but, um, our, our online business is definitely thriving right now, um, in, in these times. So, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go yes. online afterwards and buy a, a, a pair of Insta pumps. Oh, awesome! Totally. I don't know that you'll find it on our U.S. site because nobody likes them in the U.S. But oh, I've got my, I've got my sources. <laughs> I'll have to figure out who made that gray and blue one and, and get it to you. 
Okay, <laughs> I'm counting on it. Uh, okay, we've got another question from a young alum, Samantha. Um, hey. Hi, Krista, she says. What is the best <laughs> advice you received that helped you shape the early part of your career? Also, do you have any advice for graduating college seniors looking to enter this industry? Yeah, so the best advice, I guess, um, would be like not to cut corners. I had a, I had a, a boss right out of um, college. Like my, it started out as an internship and then I got hired at the agency full time. But, um, you know, she was very, very detail oriented. Um, and not that I was cutting corners, but it was always like, make sure you do the thing right um, because, you know, this has to be client facing or, you know, this is, it's, it's the statement from the company and you want to make sure that it's, but I guess in a broader sense, like don't cut corners, like don't expect that you're going to come out of school and have that dream job. And it might, your dream job might be like three or four jobs away from where you are right now. You know what I mean? And I think putting in the work early, um, understanding that, you know, I see it a lot, unfortunately, with like our, our interns and co-ops. It's just this kind of aversion to, to doing work and to going the extra mile. Um, and I think that that's a way to really stand out is to understand like, okay, this might not be a glamorous thing, but this is what the work involves. Um, and if I want that reward of, you know, being at a really awesome global brand someday, I don't definitely by no means consider myself like successful, but I definitely feel successful because I'm doing something I really love. Um, and I, I think like success is definitely the journey of it and getting to that place. Um, so, you know, who knows what that looks like for me, but I think, um, you know, my, my biggest piece of advice would be to understand like what you're really passionate about, put in the work, really focus on like what you love and then be strategic with finding ways to, um, yeah, to make money, but do something that you actually enjoy because, you know, you've got the life that you're in school and then you've got the life that you're retired and everything in between is your entire life and you better enjoy it because it's the bulk of it. You know, people are looking toward retirement every day. Um, but we should focus on like what we, what we love right now. Like what, what are you doing right now that you can love instead of looking for something that's not guaranteed. That's great advice for Samantha. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't cut corners. We say that at Hill. We actually say don't cut corners at Hill. <laughs> don't cut we corners. We literally mean don't cut through the grass. Yeah, so, don't don't cut across the block. There's, there's a good metaphor there. Um, so uh, Christopher, one of our alums, has an interesting question. I'm not sure I fully understand it, but maybe you will. Okay. Uh, with the 5G rollout in full swing and the IoT ecosystem growing faster than ever, does Reebok have any plans to embed sensors in their shoes? I, that, I feel like half that question was in another language. I've been hearing a lot about 5G, obviously, and like the potential health effects and things like that. I don't know what IoT means. So if you want to maybe chat what that is, that would be interesting. But I think that's a really interesting point and something to, to bring up. I know, as I mentioned before, we have this whole futures team that's interested in, in new technologies and new innovation when it comes to our products. So if there's any way to integrate tech, that's always stuff we're looking at for sure. Okay, the IoT uh, ecosystem is the Internet of Things ecosystem. Internet of Things, okay. Includes so, all the components that enable businesses, governments, and consumers to connect to their IoT devices. So there we go. Like Fitbits, she says. Internet of got Things. Got it. Got it, got it. Oh, yeah, 100%. So, I mean, that, that would definitely take product to the next level. I mean, if you look at, you know, the Nikes of the world, they have shoes that lace themselves. They have shoes where you can track your, your miles just through the sole of the shoe. I think that that's a space where, you know, we, we should look at more. Um, Maybe we can uh, do some contact tracing uh, through yeah. shoes. You know? Yeah, that would be amazing. Where our shoes go. Okay, we have a couple more questions up. A hand is up. You ready for another? Uh, sure, I say, I'm ready. Uh, you know, uh, well, it's, it's the same. I think it's the same person, but hold on. Okay. Christopher, are you there? Christopher. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Do you want to add to your question? No, that kind of answered it. I mean, um, it just seems to be the trend. They're putting sensors in everything. And yeah. 5G is supposed to make real time, you know, uh, what would you call it? real-time decision-making possible. Um, and uh, I've been talking to uh, one of our alumni, Chris, you know, Chris Downey, I don't know if you know him, he's the CEO of a company called Flex, uh, Flex Central. And mm -hmm. they're really into the intelligent edge. And this is something Microsoft is really hot on too. So they say 75% of all the information in the world will be processed at the edge of 
the network, not in the center in data centers like Google does it now, for instance. So um, 5G is what will make that possible. So all kinds of cool. I've, I've been kind of following the futurists and yeah. um, there's all kinds of uh, cool products coming out that, you know, including driverless cars. Apparently they, they won't really work until they, um, <clears throat> until they can make uh, millisecond decisions. So light sounds yeah, really fast definitely. at 186,000, know, travels at 186,000 miles a second, but it only tra travels 186 miles in a millisecond. So if the nearest data center were yeah. round trip 93 miles away, it would be too far away to make an instantaneous decision. So all of our, pro our clothes, our shoes, our cars, um, we'll be communicating with one another. So they, you know, they said there's like 30 billion sensors out there now. So I was just wondering what, how the shoe market was going to play that off. Yeah, I mean, all of that is fascinating to me. I mean, you obviously are super well read on all of that stuff. And I think like that's, I'm certain that our futures team is, is aware of, of that technology and, and certainly looking into a future state of how that can be incorporated. But I will say, um, our focus right now has been like predominantly on sustainability and just finding ways to, you know, make all of our products sustainably and have a, a zero carbon impact, if you will. So I, I guess like tech wise, that stuff we're always thinking about, especially when, as it relates to our fitness product. And I think, you know, with, with 3D imaging too has been a really interesting one. And this liquid technology we have, there's a lot of tech out there that will inherently make things more sustainable and create less waste. But um, a lot of the stuff you're mentioning is stuff that I didn't really even know about. So I'm Super excited to see. I, I would hope that our, our teams are aware of that stuff. Thank you. Cool. I wanted to thank you. Um, you connected with me and we'd never met before. That's, um, we sort of had a no, a don't say no policy of the older grants yeah. at least. And it doesn't matter if you're 10, gen, you know, 10, 20 years apart. If someone asks you to connect on LinkedIn, for instance, you would automatically say yes. And we're told to do that. Um, I they actually had a, uh, the, our headmaster kind of gave us a talk in the Rose Garden about that before we graduated. And I yeah. know sometimes the younger generation just ignore you if you weren't in the same class. Um, they didn't get the same speech, but I really appreciate that um, you kind of see it as an ecosystem and that we all need to work together. So um, we already totally. did connect on LinkedIn, right? Thanks for doing it without ever knowing me. Yeah, of course. I Again, as I said before, um, on things like LinkedIn and, and other networking platforms like that, if I see the Hill or I see, you know, my, my college alma mater, I always hit yes. Um, so it's, it's on you from there. If there's something else you want, you want to ask, but um, I'll, I'll always connect. I'm happy to. No, I just wanted to say thank I'm happy you. Happy I did that. <laughs> Christopher, thanks yeah. for uh, showing up and thanks for teaching uh, Kristen and me what IoT is. I'm going yeah, to use that from now on. Out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> now, now I feel like a nerd. <laughs> Uh, no, no. Not a nerd. Nerds make the world go round. So that's awesome. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. All right. Uh, two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Patty okay. uh, would like to know, Reebok's target audience, 18 to 25 year olds, seem to be the most vocal about social justice issues. How yeah. does that influence Reebok's strategy, especially during times like these? Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's everything. So, you know, to your point, these kids want to know what we're doing, not what we're saying. They're more impressed by actions, not just words. Um, so I think it's it's very easy for a brand to say, oh, we support, you know, the LGBTQ plus community and here's a shoe that we want you to buy. But they want you to go the extra step to understand, well, how are you really supporting the LGBTQ community? Because it sounds like you just made a product to benefit off of a certain community. So I think everything we do has to relate back to, you know, okay, well, how are we tying this back to giving back to, to a certain community or partner or social issue? There's definitely guardrails in terms of like social issues that we stay away from or that we're, we're really excited about um, being involved with and, and helping out with in whatever ways we can. Um, but that's, it's, it's a really great point. I mean, it's, it's, it'd be interesting to see how much um, with everything that's going on and what you know, the world will look like over the coming months, how much more we'll have to incorporate charitable efforts into everything we're doing um, across the board. So it's a good question. Yeah. All right. The last word, um, and maybe I'll yeah. add a little question after that, because I, okay. I promised you I would. Um, Leon, <laughs> uh, who's an avid listener, and it's great to hear from Leon. Uh, he's an alumnus. Um, you have a great ability to express your views on different subjects. So he starts with a compliment. Uh, Thanks. 
And then he says, do you feel these skills were developed from parental training, scholastic or college experiences, peer group exchanges or professional exchanges, uh, professional experiences? Well, thanks for the compliment. That's really nice. Um, I never feel like I know what I'm saying. So I'm happy that somebody understands me on the other side of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess it's like you are, you're the product of your environment and like all of your experiences. So I would say all of the above, um, you know, I have incredible parents who are amazing communicators and, you know, I practice public speaking in front of them. I prepare for everything with them growing up. And, you know, my mom was, you know, a language teacher. Um, she substituted at the Hill a few times. And so I think I had a natural propensity for like languages and um, was super interested in that. But in terms of like communication, I definitely feel like I kind of, you, you come into your voice as you like grow more confident and get older and, and really kind of know what you're talking about and have gone through things. And I certainly feel like I have a lot more to learn, but um, definitely feel like in my professional careers where I kind of learned to speak up at the table, you, you have a seat at the table for a reason. So if you have something to say, you're, you're in the room for a reason, speak your mind and don't be afraid of what people might think of you. I think that a, a lot of young people come into rooms and are afraid to speak up, but the ones that do, you're like, oh, bring that person back for another brainstorm. They're great. You know, and I think that being young is, is definitely an, an asset. And if, as long as you're willing to, to work, I think people, especially in industries like mine, where we're trying to sell to, to young people, but people in the room might be you know, 40, 50 years old, and they have no idea what's going on in youth culture. So I think it's really important to stay connected to, to, to the youth. And um, I'm, yeah, I mean, just use your voice. That's what it's there for. Okay, so I get the last word or the last question anyway. Awesome. Uh, while we were sort of in the green room getting ready for this call, I, I asked you if you would consider yourself an influencer. And uh, your response was, you don't like that word. No, uh, I don't. <laughs> So tell, I tell us what, what you, why it is you don't like that word and, and, and sort of what that means. Some of us don't even really know what an influencer is. And Yeah. So I think, so I think the word influencer has come to mean certain things that make me like squirm nowadays just because of social media in general. Um, and sorry, are you still there? I'm here. I thought I lost you for a second. Okay, great. I asked um, a tough question. You disappeared. No, no, no. I know. I was like, what's going on with my phone? Um, so you know, I, I guess like to me, an influencer is somebody that is truly influencing something. I think the word has been cheapened by social media in a lot of ways. Anybody can be an influencer just because you have thousands of followers. Um, but when you really look at it and if you, um, if you really know like who's who and who's really influencing decisions, like they're not even on social media or if they are, they, they don't have thousands of followers and a blue check next to their name. Um, so for me, I, I like to think that I can have an influence on people, but what I call myself an influencer, like influ true influencers to me are people like, you know, the MLKs or like incredible, like Michelle Obama, Barack Obama, like these people that truly do have a way of moving people and inspiring people um, to take action. But that's not to say that fashion influencers, because I work with a lot of them, can influence you to buy something and to buy a product because of the way they wear it or style it. So I think that there's definitely a spectrum of, of influence. Um, but am I an influencer? I don't think so. Some might people think, some people might think I am. Um, but, you know, I, I hope that I influence people to, um, to kind of go after what they go after what they want and um just it's a constant journey figuring out what you want and what you want to study what you want to do but uh, where your career will take you so I think you know be influenced to to go on the journey of that I would say well uh you definitely have uh, brought a great voice uh tonight and we're really yeah. grateful for you being here tonight uh, great, great save on your technology there oh my god I know right I you had downloaded a, you the I you had my heart going there for a minute and uh, Same. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, thanks for being here tonight. Um, as always, I want to remind our uh, viewers about our uh, upcoming speakers um, uh, on May 14th, uh, which is, I'm sorry, we've got a little confusion here. April 30th, which is our next show will be Justin Newton class of 91, who's the CEO at NetKey Incorporated. Um, Justin, I had a chat with Justin today, really fascinating what he's working on right now. NetKey is sort of a blockchain crypto uh, in, uh, company, but he's working right now, Krista, you'll appreciate this, on credentialing yep. uh, for different tests, uh, like antibody tests and live body tests for COVID-19. So providing organizations and companies and 
uh, industries with a way that we will have on our phone, you know, I can prove that I am, you know, I have antibodies or I have been tested recently. Um, and that that's, will help us get back to work and back to school. And so we're gonna hear all about that. It's pretty cool. That's um, super interesting. I just saw something about that on, um, on CNN there in China, especially through Weibo, which is like the way they communicate over there. They're, they're doing a similar thing and it kind of brings up like privacy issues too, which would be an interesting thing. Maybe I'll join that one and ask about that. Yeah, you that. should because <laughs> actually that, I asked Justin what makes his product different than others is the privacy issue. And I think that yeah. goes back to the blockchain. Cool. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll learn more about that. Um, we're working on some speakers for next week. Um, so uh, don't be surprised, we'll have them. Um, and then on May 14th, we'll be joined by Colonel Pete Sniffen, class of 81, parent of class of 19, who's a, a, a chaplain at the US Army War College, has had a long career as an army chaplain. We'll, we're gonna talk about faith. We're gonna talk about religion. We're gonna talk about the army, uh, all of the above. And then on May 19th, we'll be joined by Senator Pat Toomey, a uh, cl uh, parent of class of 18 and a uh, parent of a graduating uh, senior, his son, Patrick, um, who's a U.S. Senator for Pennsylvania. And uh, I think that'll be a really interesting time. Uh, as Pennsylvania starts to reopen its economy on May 8th, um, we'll hear from one of our two senators here about what that looks like uh, in the state and, and uh, globally as well. Um, so a, a pretty good cast of characters here. Krista, thanks for being here again. Yeah, thank you so much. It was awesome. And I'm going home to order my Insta pumps. Yeah, please do. If you can't find them, just let me know. I can uh, probably hook you up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Have a good night. Thank, thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll see you uh, we'll see you Thursday night for Colonel Sniffin. Excuse me, for Justin Newton. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>